<clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello. You all here? All right, all right. I mean, I know it's the last talk of the con well, second to last talk of the conference, but I know you all are still awake because I see you walking in at the very least. Uh, my name is Spencer, um, and I'm here to talk to you today about designing and building uh, RESTful APIs uh, that will hopefully exist for as long as they're useful for. Uh, before I start, I wanted to thank you all for coming to this amazing event. This is my third time being here in Poland for DEF CONF, uh, and it's really a pleasure to be um, among such people who are, ask great questions and are really enthusiastic about technology. So uh, thank you again for having me. Um, before I begin, I wanted to, uh, before I before I begin, I wanted to point out that uh, my, my Twitter handle is at Schneidenbach, um, and that is that is where you can find me if you have questions about anything that we talk about today. Uh, just because I walk out of the event, it'll fly back to the United States. That doesn't mean the conversation is over. So feel free to reach out um, or come up to me after the talk. And uh, usually with REST APIs, inevitably there's a line of people wanting to ask questions because there's a lot of questions to answer. And uh, Speaking of, that is pretty much going to be the main point of the talk today. Uh, the main point of this talk is to sort of lay a foundation to get you to think about and ask questions as you're designing APIs, as you're designing and building APIs, to think about the things that are important uh, from the part before you write any code to all the way to the time when you retire it. Uh, this talk is meant to give you things to think about. And uh, at the end of the day, you probably will leave this talk with more questions than answers. And that's by design, right? I'm giving you things to think about, but ultimately, APIs are built uh, by people, and people operate in different ways inside of different companies, inside of different countries. So um, ultimately, this is going to be a lot of food for thought, which is a good thing. Uh, and if you come away looking like this guy, just kind of confused, then, uh, then I know that I've done my job. But... Uh, I know that you can do it with the uh, help of you, your team, and of course, if you, uh, and of course, Google. And at the end of the day, it's this. The point of the point of talking about this is that API design is hard. Um, it is not an easy thing. Uh, most people think API design. Many people think, and not most. Many think that uh, API design starts when you go file new project or file new solution. Uh, at the point of starting to be, at, at the point of building the API is when you really need to start thinking about uh, what you're going to build. Uh, they, they don't go in with a plan. They just kind of go gung-ho, and they're just like, you know, as developers, that's kind of our nature, right? Uh, most of us in the audience, I expect, are developers, and uh, our nature is to want to go out and build something. Uh, I have conversations with my boss all the time where, I'm, where we talk about some architectural thing or this code change that we want to make, and I'm... And before we can get, when it just becomes a conversation. And before, you know, at the end of the meeting, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to my desk and I'm going to start writing it. And he's like, pump your brakes, Spencer. We still got a lot of thinking to do. So I fall prey to this too. But at the end of the day, it's important to, to know that we need to do some things before we think about what we're going to do for file. Before we do file new project, there's things that we need to think about. Because at the end of the day, API design is user experience for developers. If you told, if your boss told you that, um, actually, we're not going to worry about the user experience. Uh, we're going to just build UIs, and we're just going to kind of guess, and uh, hopefully we'll come away with, uh, with something that's workable and usable. Um, I think most front-end people would call him crazy, him or her crazy. And it's just a bottom, the bottom line is that API design is important. And that is kind of the, let's pick the two words out of the title of this talk that are really to focus in on, which is long haul, right? Um, my mom is a COBOL programmer. COBOL is a language that's been around for 50-something years, right? Uh, the other day she came to me, she was really proud. She said, Spencer, guess what I did? How many people are ASP.NET developers? ASP.NET developers, a good portion of you. Uh, well, she came to me recently and said, hey, Spencer, I... I, uh, I, I did something really cool. And I said, what was that? And, I, and she said, I made a ja ja an Ajax call with JavaScript to an ASP page, and then I called a COBOL program and made it do something. Aren't you proud of me? And I said, absolutely, Mom. I'm really, it's really cool that you're, you know, we can finally talk about, like, the same technology that we share. I was like, so what, is it ASP.NET 4? Is it ASP Core? ASP.NET Core? And she said, oh, no, I think they called it classic ASP. This was like last, this was like a few months ago. 
So the point being is that she works on systems that have been around for 30 plus years. And it very well could be that if you build an API that a lot of people use, that especially a lot of slow moving enterprises use, it may be around for a while. And that's really important, right? The, really, the, the main takeaway being is that all software has a life cycle associated with it. And your life cycle may be three months. The life cycle of this API that you build, whatever the case may be, may be three months. It may be 30 years. It may be 300 years. You just can't predict that. You can't predict that always with a great deal of accuracy. But before we talk about it, since this is a talk about REST APIs, I really want to talk to you about what REST is. I think that this is really important to kind of understand um, what REST itself is. So REST, it stands for Representational State Transfer. And it was, it was um, how do they say? It was uh, described in a paper by a guy named Roy Fielding in 1999 who was doing a dissertation, a PhD, dis PhD dissertation. So he described a state, a system that was called REST, representational state transfer. And representational, uh, REST is not anything to do with HTTP. It has nothing to do with HTTP. It has nothing to do with JSON. It has everything to do, it's just all it is, it's a, an a set of architectural constraints, right? It's not even a spec. It's, there's no spec to be associated with REST. All it does is says if you're, it's kind of like an interface. It says if your architecture fits this interface, then you're a RESTful system. So let's talk about those different constraints uh, really quickly. So first one is client server. Client server simply says that there is a client and that there is a server, that there is a client server relationship. That's all that means, right? Your web browser talking to some web server on Azure, whatever the case may be, that's all that that means. Ne next constraint is cacheable. Essentially that a response to a request can describe itself, its cacheability, right? It should be able to tell the caller, uh, you should be able to cache this for a month or a week or a day or even not at all. So it is, it describes itself, the response describes itself as cacheable or not. A request is, or sorry, a RESTful system is also stateless. That is to say that all of the state to execute that request is contained within the request itself. How many people have ever done ASP.NET and relied on session state for a huge part of your application? Right? Yeah, that's the good stuff right there, session state. That never led to any uh, bugs or strange behaviors. Back in the web forms days when uh, web development really was still in its infancy, and one could argue that it still is, uh, we relied on session state a lot, right? I mean, that's just kind of what we, that's kind of what we did, and a lot of times we didn't know what else to do it. Every time, do with a piece of data. Every time I open up a web forms application, because I still do, I always see session state used a lot. It just is what it is, right? It's just the way things were back then. Session state is strictly not a stateless thing, right? It literally is. It's right there in the word session state. So strictly speaking, a web forms application that relies heavily on session state, not stateless, which is okay, but it just means it's not restful. A system can be layered, and layered essentially means that uh, the client making the request, uh, the 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 layer from which that request is served maybe is invisible to the client, and it really the client doesn't care. It could be sent from a load balancer, a cache server, doesn't really matter. Code on demand is probably is the optional constraint, and it essentially means that the server can send code to the client to be consumed and read and used um, for the purposes of enhancing that experience. The easiest example there is JavaScript pretty simple. And then uniform interface, which in itself has four constraints of its own. First being that resources. We, call, we think at the end of REST endpoints, or really any HTTP endpoints, we are served something called a resource. A resource is a representation of a real thing. When we make a web request to get an employee from uh, an accounting system, we're not actually get, they're not actually sending us like, here's the Mongo database, here's the row number, here's the row, right? They're not physically sending us that. They're just sending us some text in a shape, a JSON shape, hopefully, or XML or something similar. And that thing is a representation. It is a resource. And resources can be identified via URLs. So in this case, employee 1234 is being gotten from that, and then that data is returned. A resource has meaning, right? Just because it's not the actual thing, just because it's an abstraction, doesn't mean it's not useful. A resource 
can be manipulated with those representations, right? You can turn around and make requests back to manipulate those resources. Content that is received from a request is self-descriptive. That is, it tells you what content type. And in HTTP, that's strictly speaking, usually just uh, stuck in the header, right? It tells you what the content type of the response is. And finally, uh, probably one of the more debated things in REST API implementation is hypermedia as the engine of application state, or HATIOAS. I think that's how they actually pronounce it. Um, strictly, so HATIOAS essentially says that the links that you use to navigate your web experience are sent from the server. The client doesn't know them ahead of time, right? So. If you, go to, if you go to a website and it has, you know, home, about, FAQ, you click on that FAQ button, the, the, the client, you ahead of time, or, not, or your client machine, had no idea what that URL was, probably, right? If it's a new website you're visiting, or whatever the case may be. And they, we shouldn't have an expectation that we knew that ahead of time. The server, that anchor tag, just click, you go to the next web page. That's hey to us. In the context of REST APIs, um, the debate signed to centers around uh, whether or not you should send links back. Uh, for example, if you're getting a customer, theoretically you could send back a link so that they can get their AP invoice data. So it, it's debated as to whether or not that's important or that's useful. Some people really strongly believe it. I'm not one of those people, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. Because we still have to talk about what a REST API is. And Oftentimes, this is just a subject of, subject of confusion, but it's always something that I need to address, that a REST API is an API that follows the RESTful constraints. It does not have anything to do with HTTP or JSON, which is fine, right? Those are things that are they're related, but they're not the same. So I'm going to go with the kind of colloquially, I don't think I'm saying that right, kind of the well-understood definition of what a REST API is. Essentially, an HTTP API that returns typically some kind of data, structured data, typically like JSON, right? We'll just go with that definition for now. Because at the end of the day, a RESTful API, just because your API is not strictly RESTful, doesn't mean that it's good. I have talked to people who have, you know, kind of, it's, to me, it's kind of like, how, you know, we do Agile by the book. By what book? There's like a thousand books. And then if you're doing Agile by the book, in my opinion, and in many people's opinions, you're not doing it, you're, you're kind of missing the point, right? Uh, some people will focus, I've, I've talked to a couple of people, mostly, you know, as part of my job, who say, we made this, we worked really hard to make this API, strictly speaking, RESTful, but it's not a good API. They come away really proud, though, because they have a RESTful API. They did hate to us. There's no statefulness, right? They're really, and so they think that they've done something as spectacular as this trick, where he switches the shit skateboards, and then he's like, oh, the developers and the managers are like, oh, yeah, this API is RESTful, when in reality, they, their documentation was poor, or the API has questionable uptimes or really problematic bugs. And the API kind of ends up, or at least the consumer ends up, looking more like this. What I like about this GIF is that <laughs> the skateboard ends up on top of her head as if, like, ah, oh, yeah, you failed, and that it just really sends that message home. I have worked with this one API I can think of in particular. They had everything restful. They had everything right. But it was one of the worst APIs I'd ever used. So I'm going to make it bigger just to get the message across. Just because your API is strictly speaking restful does not mean that it's good. We should instead focus on just making good APIs, right? Take, what's, take what you can, is useful in REST, like the statefulness. That's a really useful thing. And just throw the rest out, right? If you don't need hey to us, if you don't think you'll need it, if you don't think you'll want it, or you think it's more than your consumers will want, you don't have to use it. When I make APIs, I almost never use um, hey to us and, uh, most, and most APIs that I consume. A little bit of background on me. I consume a lot of APIs as part of my job because I write integration software. Lots of them don't because they have the documentation there to tell me what the APIs are. So let's talk about, oh, yes, right. So REST APIs, specifically because there's a lot of choice around REST APIs, right? So when you're building an API, you have a lot of different things you can do, right? What status codes should I use? There's like 100. Uh, what should I use for a format, JSON or XML? Today, you typically choose JSON. But then you're like, okay, well, should I use camel case or should I use Pascal case? 
or uh, should I be, um, oh, I don't know, what a, uh, how should I return my error responses back to my caller, right? Should I just have a list of error messages or should I be really specific, right? There's a lot of choices. And so you can't talk about long living or REST APIs or long haul APIs in general without at least mentioning GraphQL. So the big difference to me, so I, I have not, so GraphQL, if you're not familiar with it, is a spec. It is an actual spec. It's a specification that you, that you um, code or write to that allows you to define how APIs how you can use a specific kind of API. And it was built by Facebook. It was purpose built by Facebook for a really Facebook-y kind of reason, I guess. And I, this guy who is a big React person, his name's Corey House, he's a good friend of mine. And he said, tweeted out something where I was like, I, I, I've argued with him endlessly. I've said, GraphQL is just not gonna win over REST today. It's too esoteric. It's just, how many people in this audience, just out of curiosity, how many people use GraphQL or write GraphQL applications? Okay, a few of you. How, have you, how many of you have written some kind of RESTful API? Okay, I expect that that ratio will be kind of like that probably for a while, right? GraphQL has a lot of good associated with it. But at the end of the day, most people understand REST APIs really well, and most people understand consuming them really well. But he got me here, where he said that REST isn't, GraphQL can do, can't, it's not like it can do things that REST can't, but REST, GraphQL is a spec. It gives you a clear path to build an API, right? Where REST, there is no clear path. You just make it up as you go. You could almost just make it up as you go. So the point of one of the things that I'm going to tell you about, one of the things that I encourage is for you to build your own spec. Make, you know, use Google, figure out what other people do. Look at other API documentations and see how they, um, how the interface to their system looks. How does their documentation look? The goal at the end of this is to get you to think about what you would do. What would you put in your own REST spec? Not re a spec for REST, but when you build APIs in your company, what kinds of things at a minimum should it have? So we're going to talk about the who, what, where, when, or sorry, not when, because when is probably yesterday if it's your boss. Who, what, where, why, and how. But we're going to switch up just a little bit. We're going to say why, who, what, how, and where. Because at the end of the day, how and where are technology questions. And when we're designing REST APIs, it's really important that we put the tech, we just turn that C-sharp knob off in our head and just think about REST APIs. Think about what the consumer wants. So we're going to answer the tech, even if the technology question has already been answered. We know it's going to be ASP.NET Core. We know it's going to be Node. We know it's going to be hosted on Azure or AWS or under, you know, somebody's server in somebody's desk in accounting, right? We know where it's going to be. Those probably have already been decided. But we need to put those aside, at least while we're thinking about how we're designing our APIs. And that comes before file solution. I know. It just is. So the first thing that we need to focus on is why. Why are we building this API? What do we intend for it to do? Why, what is its purpose, right? Really understanding the why behind your API is just really important. Is it in support of a, a single page application or a mobile or something like a mobile app? Is it designed for internal use? So is it an API that's designed for somebody inside your company to get some data from you uh, in order to do something or understand something? And or is it or is it for integration? Is it an API that you expose to your customers to enable them to build uh, applications or build integrations between your application and them, right? And these things are important to know, right? We need to know why our API is existing because it's going to, excuse me, at the end of the day, um, internal use versus integration has a whole different support profile, right? So if you're a 200-person company, you can, you can sometimes skimp on things like, you know, internal use documentation. You can probably just put that in the common place and it doesn't have to be worked on. Maybe the authentication scheme between those two things is well understood. But when you're talking about an integration API that, are, that you're expecting your external customers to use, that's a whole different level of work. You're not talking about just building the API. You're talking about uptime. You're talking about documentation, really getting those things right. So it's really important to understand where are you going to put your time and effort. And that, un that starts with understanding the why behind your API's existence. This is how I, that I thought this quote fitted pretty well. 
if you don't understand what it is you're building or why you're building it or who you're building it for, how can it truly meet their needs? How can it meet your needs? How can it be successful? Enough said, right? <laughs> All right, so who, right? This kind of goes along with why, but it's important to understand the level of user that's going to use it. If you're talking about, oh Lord, years ago, I, um, I built this API for this really small co company, and what they were doing was trying to know when somebody was entering a room. They wanted to send an API request with that user, with that user's information. And the guy on the other end didn't know what JSON was, but he did know how to parse like query strings. So at, what did I do? I designed the API so that it returned uh, for data like you would get in a form, your, a form encoded request off to the server or something that looks like it was in the query string. It's just because I understood, I felt like I understood my user and I did. They were happy with what I delivered, even though I really wanted to use JSON. I, I, had to, I put in that extra effort and it was worth it because at the end of the day, the customer was happier. So who will use it? Really important question. Who will test it? That's a really, really important question, especially if you're talking about an API that is external to your company. So, uh, when, when, you, so when we're building integrations for, for between different products, oftentimes what we'll do is identify the customers who have been asking for that, either usually existing customers or sometimes people who have just been, maybe they call my CEO every week and say, hey, Tom, is this done yet? Can you, can, have you built this out yet? The people who are chomping at the bit. Because oftentimes, th those people might be the ones responsible for testing that integration. Same thing goes with the API, right? They, might, they will provide to you valuable feedback, stuff that you can use to really make your API excellent. And who will help it go from pay to the prod? Kind of the same thing, right? When you're trying to establish um, the fit of your API or trying to figure out what it's used for and what it will be useful for for the consumers, um, oftentimes that this is a period of change, right? Beta is a period of change. So who's going to help you promote it, get it from point A to point B, which I guess point B would be production. So what? What is kind of one of the questions that we're trying to answer in this talk or the things that I'm trying to get you to think about? What status codes do we use? What, this is when you get down to the nitty gritty. What's the URL formatting going to be? What status codes are we going to use? How are we going to format our data? If you're working with an older company, it, they might have engineers that only know XML really well. So you might just be forced to use XML. That's fine, I guess. But the point is, is that we still have to answer those questions. And that's what this talk, most, most of the talk, this talk is going to be about. And then, of course, how and where, right? Where is it that it's going to end up? Is it going to end up in Azure? Because deployment at the end of the day, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't, that was almost a secondary thought. Today, it's almost the first thought. Well, how are we going to deploy it? How are we going to ensure uptime? How are we going to ensure that we meet our SLAs if we have those? Um, how are we going to code it? If we have one team that uses C Sharp and another team that uses JavaScript with Node, right? Whichever team is responsible for that is probably going to own that. That technology decision is probably going to be there. Point is, we should begin with the end in mind. What do we want? What is ultimately, like, are we going to, do we think we're going to serve 100 customers or 1,000 or a million? Uh, where is it going to be hosted? Just because we don't think about, we try not to think about those things too much in the design phase, right? In the design phase of our API. But it's the reality, right? Especially when you have to think about things like uptime or documentation. Who's going to own that documentation step? So I have a few simple rules to follow. <laughs> First thing is, don't be creative, be predictable. Uh, I talk about this over and over again. Uh, I'll give you an example of a creative API. Facebook, which they can get away with being creative, they don't use status codes to describe responses. They use the response body itself. They always send back 200 if the request made it to the server. And you have to inspect the body in order for you to tell whether or not the request was successful or not okay, that's fine. You know, Facebook is that big. Maybe they just decided, you know, this is what we're going to do. But in the mo for the most part, when we're talking about, you know, developers like you and me, we're talking about people that do expect us to use status codes the way they were intended, right? So try to, and, but, and try not to use status codes in a way they won't, won't be intended. I'll have an example of that shortly to illustrate how bad it is. It's important as well to be consistent. If you, if you have an API with 100 endpoints, by golly, I really hope that you have the same error format uh, between all of those endpoints. If there's a 400 bad request, I would hope that at least 95% of those APIs would use that bad, request, that bad request structure 
And at the other 5%, you had to make an exception for some reason. We have APIs like that where I work, where we build APIs. And first thing I did was I said, because 400 bad requests is my favorite status code, uh, I said that we're really going to focus on making sure that this, we're gonna, one of the things that we're going to do is make sure that these error messages are inconsistent. And when the teams would build the APIs and not make the error messages consistent, oh, it was so confusing. <laughs> it was confusing for me. You know, I wasn't doing all of the work. And it's important to get the important stuff right. Don't bike shed on things that don't matter. In other words, don't focus in on little details. Don't hold hour, two hour long meetings with half the team to decide whether or not it's gonna be slash employee or slash employee, singular versus plural, right? Sometimes it's, it, it's more important to get the bigger things right. The documentation, the consistency, those are really important. You know, whether or not they're singular or plural doesn't matter as much. So step zero, start by designing the basic behaviors of your whole API. So some of the things that we need to consider, security, what, how are we gonna, what's the entryway into the system? Do we have, does everybody have a code to enter the system? Is it, if it's an internal API or if it's an external one, are they gonna connect with OAuth and then use those tokens? Status codes, whether or not they're gonna be, uh, what, are we gonna use 201 uh, when something is created? Are we gonna use, when something is created with an API? Are we gonna use 204 when something is deleted, right? Which those are intended for and lots of people use them that way. What's the response format gonna be? Is it gonna be XML or JSON? How are we gonna deal with the leaky abstractions? I'll get to that in a minute. How are we gonna deal when errors happen? Because errors do happen, so what are we gonna do with those errors? And then how are we going to version our API, which should be one of the first things that you think about. So let's talk about these things. So security first. So first thing to talk about, authentication versus authorization. Authentication is the manner of telling the API who you are. Authorization is, is making the API being aware enough of who you are to know whether or not you can do a thing. So let's talk about the authentication OAuth is a really common one. This is one that I see um, used everywhere. And uh, you see it if you ever um, go to an application where you have to log in as Facebook or log in as Twitter. They will complete an OAuth workflow so that they can get information about you so that you can be logged into their system. Right? I also see people just use OAuth systems for you to just say, you know, here's where you can get yourself a token, and then you can use that token to interact with our API. Basic authentication, I've seen it used in similar ways, but I'm gonna talk about one use case that I see sometimes, um, and that one that I really wish I didn't, which is basic authentication using an actual username or password into their application. And this is a really bad idea. Typically, you want to use some kind of key structure uh, when you're interacting with an API. If you just, so Twitter a long time ago, they had a basic authentication scheme where they would pass, where you would give them a username and password and they would log in as you. The problem with that was, is that they didn't have no idea. They just gave you unfettered access to your Twitter account. How many people in this room want to give Facebook or another consumer unfettered access to their Twitter account? Nobody. There's a reason why we, when we use Facebook to authenticate to something, this, we make, it puts the little lock that says, this will not post to Facebook for you. Right? So basic authentication using people's real username and passwords really should be avoided. This is the most common, this is a very common one alongside OAuth that I see. And it's my preferred method for m lots of different applications um, for lots of different reasons, especially within my own company. And it just basically says, here's a key that you can use to authenticate with our application. The good thing is, is we can issue multiple keys for like a user and then have those keys do different things depending on who they want to hand that key over to if they want to hand it over to another company so they can put data in on their, on their behalf, right? So in this case, this is just an HTTP header with X application key and it just says, you know, this is, this is the secret key that you use to authenticate with this system. Very simple, very straightforward, and best of all, it's very easier for developers, very easy for developers to understand and use. So authorization is a different conversation. Um, ASP.NET Core has its own opinions about how uh, auth auth authorization should be handled, whether or not it be roles and claims or roles claims combined with a policy, right? How you authorize the access to your resources in your application is really gonna be up to you and your other developers. So it's kind of a, que it's kind of a question of, really it gets into, you know, how, do you, how are you building your API? How's your system act? So, other than things to think about there is like, how do you want to segment access to different parts of your API? 
that's really the only thing that you really, that's the thing that I want you to take away is like, how would I do that if I was building an API? So, status codes. When we're talking about status codes, 200 OK, very common. I, you see this for uh, get requests, put requests, post requests, where they say something is, uh, you know, something has happened uh, or your request has succeeded and that's, that's it, right? And then they use other status codes to describe other things like 201 created, when you create a resource. I personally don't use 201 created, I just use 200 OK, but it's there for you if you want it. 400 bad request, again, my favorite error message. I'll get to that in a little bit and describe to you how I think errors should really be. 404 not found, very simple. I don't know what's on the other end of this resource. Either it's an ID that doesn't exist, or it is a, or it's an API that just, uh, an endpoint that just doesn't exist overall. And then of course, unauthorized, which is authorization, fa authentication failed versus forbidden, which authorization has failed, AKA I know who you are, but you can't do that. Here's an example of a bad API. <laughs> and I'm not gonna say who this API is, but this is a real error message that I get back from them. Uh, it turns out that when an employee in their system does not exist, uh, they don't send back a 404, they send back a 403 that says authentication failed. And we tried this with an invalid token and we also got, authentic we also got authentication failed, but it was a different error message that told us that we actually were logged in. It was enough to know that when we made this request, we were logged in uh, for that request, uh, but they still sent back 403 for forbidden. This is an API that, uh, frankly, is for a huge company, and it is just riddled with inconsistencies. Please don't be this API, or the next time I give this talk, I may end up making fun of your company. Um, verbs, very simply put, I won't spend a lot of time on these. Get is getting data. Bottom line, it shouldn't mutate data in, another syst in, in your target system. If it's getting data, that's all it should be doing. Puts and posts are typically used for mutations. Uh, puts are used to update data, typically. Posts are typically associated with creating data or performing some kind of action. I also see people using post requests to update entities. I typically do use put to update and post to either perform an action or create data. Delete, um, much like the, get it, it, like the get request, it can't have anything in the body. And it really, you should expect that if you have a delete endpoint that you're actually deleting some kind of data, right? It's typically used to delete individual records. And then patch is an interesting one that even has a spec associated with it, which is, you know, instead of sending, with put requests when you have a resource, typically when you put, you have to send the whole representation of that object back or else it's gonna null out all the properties that you left out for most APIs. Patch tries to avoid that by just saying, I just wanna update these few properties. And in practice, I don't see it used a lot, but it's there if you want it. You can Google for the spec if that interests you. Format, application JSON, or application XML, right? Something, you're probably, if you're building an API, it's gonna be one of those two things. I usually don't see much else, if anything. Getting on to the question of nouns versus verbs, right? During the, we're in the design phase, we have to be talking about these things. Uh, the bottom line is, is that you should probably use plural nouns. Now, if I, if you do everything else right inside of your uh, API and you use singular nouns as an employee instead of employees, I promise I won't make fun of you on the stage. But for REST APIs that are made today, RESTful-ish APIs that are made today, typically you want to use nouns, plural nouns. That's what people expect. Uh, the other one where you're using verbs, like get all employees, usually more associated with something like RPC or SOAP. And me just saying that should give you enough reason not to use them, right? Nothing associated with SOAP. Another thing that you'll have to determine during your API design phase, how do you want to get sub-resources? How do you want to represent those? So if you're a customer, if you have a customer record, that customer record probably has invoices. If you're an accounting system, it probably has invoices associated with them. Do you want to write the invoices to directly to the parent object such that when you get that customer, you get all of the invoices associated with it? Maybe. Probably not, though, because invoices can get rather long. I looked at my Amazon order history recently, and I couldn't even get to the last page because I'd ordered so much stuff between now and, you know, 15, 10 years ago. If it's going to be an, a, a list that is going to grow and you don't, can't predict the end of that growth, I almost always rec recommend putting it as a separate request. 
and then expand parameter, which is I want to get this customer and I want you to include invoices in the response. I don't see that a lot, but it's a thing that you could think about if you're talking about high volumes of data and you want to kind of just keep those single gets as tight as possible unless the customer wants more. So uh, talking about sub-resources, if we have a job for, say, some job to build a Walmart or some other building, and we're talking about creating a phase on that job, aka pouring the concrete, uh, the project manager, you know, time, you may create a phase using a post request that looks kind of like this, right, where your API slash jobs point to the actual job you want to create a phase for, then create the phase. And then... Internally, you might do something like this, where you associate that job one, two, three, that first phase that you've created has ID one. I also see people do just use the primary key on the phase itself, right? And they just say two, three, four, and they use primary keys. A lot of people use primary keys with their API uh, because it's just convenient, right? There's a singular ID to capture phase. There's a singular ID to capture job. So let's just reuse these, right? Um, the only thing I'm going to say is I'm just giving you something to think about. If you, if you like the aesthetics of this and don't like to, and like to hide away parts of the system such that you don't want them to know that it's ID 234, that's fine. It's just food for thought, right? Just something to think about. And, of course, when you're getting data, they, we have to talk about sorting, paging, and filtering. A lot of times in practice, I don't see sorting usually exposed as a part of an API, although I do see it, especially when it's talking about an API that is uh, supporting some kind of front end. Um, paging, if you're talking a large, about a large amount of data, paging is something you should really strongly consider um, adding to your API. Uh, and there's plenty of examples to how to do it with different systems online, uh, but it is something that you'll have to think about. And then filtering, I often see, especially on get all, things, I often see ways for you to filter down what you want to get from that. What kind of data do you want to get from that? Do you want to get data that's only been modified after a certain time period, or only with the first name Spencer or Nicole? Just to, doesn't, it, it, these are just things that you have to think about. What does your API consumer want? And then, of course, let's talk about leaky abstractions. This is one of my favorite slides. So I'm going to put four words up on the screen. Theory, Annex, Threshold, and Lilia. So together, these words don't mean a lot together. It doesn't mean a lot in America. Certainly, it doesn't mean a lot in Poland. It doesn't mean a lot anywhere. These words aren't really related. They're only related if I told you that my, next, my former next door neighbor had kids, and he named them Theory, Annex, Threshold, and Lilia. These are about as strange in names as naming your kid Grass or, or Lake or anything like that. That does, does, it doesn't make any sense, right? And I didn't bother asking either why. So let's look at these words, inactive, deleted, visible, retired. This was an API that I've used, right? So these are uh, four different kinds of statuses to represent that an, uh, the state of an object, whether or not it's active or not, or deleted or not, or retired or visible. And okay, that's fine, except that the fact that this, AP, this API exposed all four of these different properties. So what is that? Eight different ways that an object can exist. So what does it mean if it's inactive and visible, but it's not retired? Like, and the best part is, is they didn't have documentation for it, and they themselves couldn't answer the questions fully. So at the end of the day, I was kind of left just going like this, like, ugh, this is terrible. The point is, don't, if, your leak, if your specific implementations are hard to understand or use, then avoid leaking them into your API. Your API should be an abstraction, bottom line. It should be an abstraction over your system. So if you have confusing things, you need to find a way to move those extraction levels up if you think your consumers aren't going to know it. If they need it, then give it to them. But use documentation, really good documentation to cover for yourself. Or else you're going to kind of left as confused as I was left after I found this GIF this morning. Why Patrick Stewart is being a ball on a kitten with Indiana Jones, I still don't know. But you don't want to leave your users like this. Keep it simple. At the end of the day, your goal is to keep it as simple as possible for the application that you're building. So errors are going to happen. How are you going to manage them? I've kind of talked about 400 bad requests being my favorite way of describing errors back. 
And it's because it's a really important request when you're talking about mutating data. You need to report back to the caller that for whatever reason or another, I can't complete your request, and it's usually because you're missing some critical piece of data. So let's look at these, post, these different error responses. This is a real example. This is an example I used on an API long ago. Thank God I don't have to use it anymore. So when creating a vendor, they would send back if I was missing, the, if I was required name and state, for example, I would send that to them, and then they'd send back to me a 400 bad request that just was a string, single string that said state is required. Okay, at least it tells me something, but like, what if it was missing 10 properties? Is it going to be like comma delimited or something? And then we have this example where we're creating an employee, and I put the employee in, and it needs a last name as well. And then it sends back. This is the same company, by the way, different parts of the same API. It sends me back this body, which is your request was invalid, but it doesn't tell me anything at all about what was wrong with the request. Personally, if I had to choose between the two, it would be the one on the left. But personally, I would honestly go with neither. And this is why. Because first of all, we've talked about consistency and error message reporting. Said that enough, I think. The important, one of the important thing is provide enough information for your caller to fix the issue with the least number of requests. And that's mainly for their convenience. So if there's a problem with five different properties, by golly, I'd hope you'd send back every one of those properties saying all of these had problems and give them enough information to solve their request, to solve their problem with as few requests as possible. You don't, I cannot tell you how many, and we've all done this, right? With some API that we've consumed where we've spent hours at Postman or some API thing, and we just could not figure out how to make this API do its job. It's just not possible. And, and then you have to reach back out to them, and that's never a fun thing to do. And then it's good to, to log requests and responses, strip out you know, sensitive information as much as you can. And return an int a request ID. Typically, they, sometimes they call it a correlation ID. Just Usually, I just generate a GUID. And then send that back to them in their response. So that way, if they do get stuck, they have an ID of a request that they can send to you and say, oh, and then you can load up that request and say, oh, I know exactly how to solve this. Here's what you need to do, right? Makes everybody's life easier. This is an example of a good error message where not only did they give you exactly what was wrong with the request, but they give you an error code, which if you're talking about API design, you may consider error codes as part of your design for error message handling. And then they give you a more info URL to tell you exactly where to go to solve your problem. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. So versioning is a change management question. It should be in the top of your mind from the get-go. Um, there's a few different ways to do versioning. Uh, first way that I, that I see a lot is pretty common is header versioning, where you give them a header to say, here's the version of the API. It may be identified in the same URI, like API slash employees, but there might be two different versions of it. This may, this may be a place where you to distinguish which version you want to use. Sometimes I have seen it, but not very often. I have seen it in the query string. Typically, I avoid this one. I either go header or route. Uh, I have seen it in the accept parameter where you have accept application JSON and then you specify the version there. Again, I don't see it a lot, but it is an option available to you. And I saved my be the best or at least my favorite for last, which is putting it in the route where you say API slash V1 slash jobs. Then it becomes really easy and really very easy for your consumer to segment like, okay, I know I'm hitting version one of this API, right? Stripe has an interesting use case where they have major APIs, but they also, major APIs that are distinguished in the route, but then they also use minor versions that you can access in the header. It's because Stripe is a huge payment processing company, and one of the things that they really want to avoid is breaking changes. They do not want to mess with people's money. In that way, they will use minor APIs in order to kind of satisfy that need, which I think for them is a really good strategy. Probably overkill for you and me, but... It's something to be thinking about, right? You got to think about what kind of change management should I be expected to provide to my consumer. And I would argue that versioning is better than making a breaking change. You would not believe the number of APIs where they would break something and suddenly an integration would stop working and they said, oh, we broke something, you know, we did this thing and we thought it would be fine. You know, we don't have any tests written for it, which is cool, right? Um, and then they push it out and they broke things, right? And we've also done things like that. Let's be real. So talking about versioning versus breaking changes. If your first API sends back 
the, a customer record that has four properties. And the next one, you're like, well, I need to add a property. And so in your mind, you're like, okay, I need to version. I, Spencer said, don't use breaking changes. So I'm just going to use version two to add on a property. And then you might end up with like version three or version 56, right? And then you're, you're, the people who are consuming your API who needed that data are probably going to want to look like this. They're probably going to want to yell at you. And that's because change management is a balancing act. If my API is in a beta period, I will add and remove properties. Tr try not to remove them, but I will add properties to an object, to the version of an object, as much as I need to, right? These are things, again, there's no right or wrong answer. You just something that you have to think about. Deprecation, or telling, communicating to your callers that APIs are dead, or that they shouldn't be used anymore, is really important. So this is an example from Concur's website, where they say this API, API has been deprecated. And they tell you their API deprecation plan. So this is good. This is good documentation. They tell you exactly what deprecation means to them. And they will even tell you, deprecated does not mean it's offline. right? A deprecated API inside of .NET They'll tell you it's deprecated, but it doesn't mean that it's that it doesn't mean anything, right? It, it means you can still use it, but they want to avoid those breaking changes. But when they retire and then decommission those APIs, that's when they're starting to make tell you that they're not available anymore. Deprecation is just please avoid. We have a better thing to, way to do this. There's other considerations which we will get into. Uh, documentation. What? How comprehensive should your documentation be? Uh, what are your SLAs? What is the uptime of your API? Do we have performance guarantees where this API will return a response within this many milliseconds? Uh, and deployment and maintenance. So getting back to the Twilio example, Twilio, again, they have a URL that gives you a nice website that you can go to. You can paste that into your browser, and you can go and see exactly what was wrong with your uh, API. And sometimes they're just really quick blurbs like this. Other times they're like, because they're text messaging, right? It's a text messaging API. They'll be like, okay, you've got a really weird error, but I'm going to walk you through exactly all the steps that you need to do to figure out where the problem is with this, it, with this error. And so their documentation is really good, really comprehensive, and really easy to use. And speaking of documentation, it is one of the most important parts of your APIs, especially if it's going to be used by many people. And it's so important that I'm going to make this word even bigger. Documentation. Bottom line, an API lives and dies by good documentation, especially if your API is massively used. If you're talking about it's going to be used by another team within your company, like I said, you can get away with less. But it's really important that you have good documentation when you need it. Swagger is an example of documentation that people use a lot, but then they won't, then a lot of people, a lot of times when they're making their APIs, uh, they won't expand onto that for whatever reason. They'll say, here's the Swagger docs go, but it doesn't tell me like, how do I authenticate? How do I, uh, you know, what problems might I encounter with these APIs? It's a good start, but it's not always complete. Twilio, again, if I had time to go through these examples, I'll tweet them out after this talk. Uh, unfortunately, I'm running low on time. But I will tweet out the examples of what I think a great an API uh, documentation is, as well as an OK example of uh, documentation. And then your SLAs. Will your API have a guaranteed uptime? What does it mean if there's downtime? For us, downtime with one particular terrible API provider meant the integrations broke. And sometimes we're in an unrecoverable state without their help. right? Performance, again, something that you may be, need to consider, especially when you're thinking about deployment. Am I deploying to something where I can scale up or scale out reasonably well? And, of course, do you even need to think about this? If you're a small company, I used to work for a smaller company than I do now, way smaller, and I created an API that's still used exactly by one consumer. I built it so that it could be used by several, and it's still exactly used by one. Uh, thankfully, I didn't build it with like a guaranteed performance thing or anything like that. Uh, but oftentimes, if they're doing quick, especially if they're doing quick primary key lookups, if it's kind of a basic REST API, you may not need to consider this. And then deployment. You don't want to end up with your deployments you know, every Thursday, Friday, Wednesday being something like this, where you, you know, step on a rake and uh, turn around. And you just realize that your whole deployment process is just a pile of rakes that you're just constantly stepping on. So utilize your tools. Recently, I built this really dinky website. And every time I deployed, it would be down for like 15 seconds. And it just drove me crazy. Until I realized that app, Azure App Service has this thing called deployment slots, 
that allows you to deploy to one slot. And then as soon as it's done deploying, they'll switch it all the traffic over to that other slot in essentially zero downtime. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. It was really awesome. So point being, maybe not all of you are on Azure, but utilize the tools that you have for maximum, maximum greatness. And then maintenance. Um, when you're talking about breaking changes, you should almost always version before you break something, right? Because breaking changes mean pissed off people, right? You're making your, cust your consumers mad for one reason or another. So in that case, if you think that something's going to break majorly, versioning is your best bet. Fix bugs and don't break things. And don't be afraid to use deprecation as a strategy. Um, finally, level of support. If you're somebody like Facebook providing an API for a huge company, if you're a huge company providing an API, the level of support that you have to provide to your people is going to look totally different than if you're a uh, one or two person team to providing an API for one other person. But the bottom lines are is that more good documentation, the more good documentation you have, the less th time that you will need for support. But you got to provide a means of people to ask, a means for people to ask for help if they need it. And make their jobs as, in the bottom line is just make their jobs as, consumer as, e as consumers as easy as possible. Just remember, in conclusion, think a little bit up front before you file a new project. Think amongst yourself, think amongst your team, right? Do a little bit of hard work ahead of time to make the whole process go smoother because you've got to think about the people that are using your API. Design a consistent spec. This is the thing that helps us out hugely when I design APIs, whether it be for somebody or for my company, giving some common behavior that that API will have is always helpful. Conform to that spec and communicate when you don't. And finally, remember good documentation and good support. If you have any other questions, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or I'll be hanging around for a little bit. Um, but otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the event. Um, thank you very much.